barely see you. I want to know that I would not need sunglasses in Minneapolis, you know. It's not a typical weather in sun. So welcome to my session. That's the last one for today except from lighting talks. And uh, so who am I? My name is Vladimir. Uh, you can find me on GitHub, Twitter, Dev2, where I'm writing some stuff occasionally, mostly Ruby gems, sometimes blog posts, and sometimes tweets. I'm working for a company, Evil Martians, that is based in Brooklyn, New York, and Moscow, Russia. And you've probably heard about our open source projects. Uh, there are just a few of them which have their own stickers. And uh, you maybe read our blog. Um, by the way, that's a brand new post uh, of mine released on Monday regarding Rails 6 and some features of it. Uh, that's all the funny stuff we do. And that funny stuff is commercial development. And today's talk is mostly about this part of my life, so working with clients' applications. And most of the projects uh, we're working on uh, could be divided into two groups. Now, the first one, the most, uh, you know, the project I like most is a project when you have to build from scratch, build something new when you have a card bunch and you can do anything. But that's a rare case. And in most cases, we're dealing with legacy projects. And uh, that means that we have to fix uh, or enhance something that built someone else and it doesn't look so shiny. So, but I like it anyway, so that's kind of my jam. What is a legacy project? Um, that's a huge topic, so I just want to say that from my personal experience, legacy projects is any project which is one or two years old. Because that's when, <laughs> that's when you have a bunch of technical debt, and then that's when you don't remember why you wrote this code a year ago. And as a team lead, I'm the first one uh, who joins the project to start working on it. And that's one of the, my first tasks is to prepare the code base for others to join, to actually start working on features. And I can't just drop a handful of developers on a new project and make them shift stuff because, uh, well, that's what I'm going to talk about, why and what you should do instead. So this talk is about uh, the process of dealing with legacy rails, but in particular applications that I came up during my years at Table Martians. And which phases it consists of, this process, and which tools do we use to make it easier, that's what I'm going to talk about today. But first, uh, let me tell one more thing about myself. I'm a board game geek. I'm a big fan of board games especially strategy ones, that's my passion. If you share this passion, you probably found the title of this talk a little bit familiar and even the cover image. That's not a coincidence. Uh, that actually, the title of the talk and the narration is inspired by the board game called Terraforming Mars. It's kind of a pretty new game, it's 2016, and, but it's very popular. It has been top one for a long time at Board Game Geek website. Uh, you should definitely check it out if you like board games. So the object of the game uh, is to make Mars, the planet, uh, habitable, to bring people there from overpopulated Earth. And during the game, you do a lot of stuff like raising oxygen level, restoring oceans, planting greens, and, uh, and so on and so, forth and so forth. So once while I was playing this game with my friends, uh, the idea came into my mind, well, this seems very similar to what actually we do as legacy projects when we start working on them. So I come with this thing like terraforming code, terraforming applications. And it's actually a very similar process of transforming the legacy code base into a habitable code base, which means that it's a good place to develop new features. You don't expect uh, some hidden dangers anywhere. It's got a good place to work, good code to work with. So let's start uh, playing this game. Every game starts with a setup phase when you just take everything from the box and you know put on the board on the table. Uh, and sometimes this process is longer than the game itself. And it's not that funny, but it's usually made by one person or maybe a couple of them, but usually one. So that's the first thing I'm doing. I'm setting up the projects. I'm setting up the development environment. So that it could take some time. And the goal of this first phase, uh, this landing phase is to make it easier 
to cold start the projects for others, or in terms of calls or commands, uh, to, to minimize the number of actions, the amount of time it's required to start running Rails server locally or Rails console or whatever. So let's talk about development environment first. By development environment, I mean all the external things like system dependencies, databases, anything not related to Ruby in particular, but we have, but, but we need to make our application up and running. And usually, uh, we see something like this in projects readme. You know, that's uh, I call it classic or old school way for setting up projects locally. Just uh, do a bunch of things, hope that extractions is up to date. Uh, Copy and paste them in your terminal, fingers crossed. So too much effort and too error prone. That's why the first thing I do when I'm joining the project, I'm configuring a better configuration, better development environment as I think. So it's kind of opinionated, but yeah. So new school stuff like Docker and containers and all that is. And by the way, I don't think I'm gonna see it, but anyway, anyone attended this workshop on Dockerizing Rails applications? Yeah. A dozen of people, so you probably know why this is cool. Yep. But I'm gonna share some major points regarding Docker for development. So first of all, it provides repeatable and predictable uh, environment setup. So no platform dependencies, no version managers. I'm not using Airbnb or RVM or whatever VM for I don't know forever, if never. So just Docker, Docker file, and Docker compose file, and that's it. Secondly, it allows you to stay in sync with your development environment. So you don't need to update images manually. You just keep changes from the repository. Next time you run the project, everything is rebuilt, or new images are pulled, and you're just using what you want to use. You don't need to worry about having different environments in different branches. It's just kind of side effect of this setup. But yeah, you, you still need to add some convention on image versioning, for example, because you don't have to use latest tag for everything in your Docker compose file. That's where things break. You should have some versioning uh, policy. Well, Docker is not a silver bird, of course. It has its own problems. One of the most popular uh, one is that it's so slow on Mac. So as you might see, or maybe not, sorry, I didn't know that it is. So I'm a Mac user. What you don't see, definitely don't see, this is Mac is five and a half years old and which is hidden from everyone, even from me, that it has four gigabytes of RAM. Yes, and I'm telling you, Docker is good enough for developing Rails applications. You just need to take care of your configuration a little bit. So there are a few tricks, like using cache folders, storing all the uh, ephemeral stuff and volumes, or even using NFS file system, which is tricky, but if you need very good performance, you can try it. We don't use it, actually. What I can tell you, whether is Docker good enough for Windows? Sorry, I have no idea about it. Let me instead share you one tool that we use to make a development process a little bit easier, which is called Deep. You probably haven't heard about it. So that's a common line tool written originally in Crystal, but uh, you know, we rewrote it in Ruby because Ruby is better. Um, it acts like a wrapper over Docker Compose, or which is more important, multiple Docker Compose files. So it's kind of provide a transparent way to configure the whole uh, application consisting of maybe multiple services from one place. And it has its useful provision hook and ZSH integration, which allows you to run all commands from your console without prepending them with kind of Docker Compose or whatever stuff, just running Rails C, and under the, under the hood, it will run a container and make it work within a container. So we did some environment configuration stuff, uh, configured our Docker environment, and we're ready to run our applications. So what's gonna happen, what do you think? Well, usually in the history of space uh, engineering, First launch fails. Uh, that could be one of these reasons, but uh, usually these uh, failures relate to configuration problems like, you know, why does someone use uh, database not on localhost, right? We just record it everywhere in our code base, mm -hmm. or the same with Redis, for example. Or we can add n uh, variables everywhere in our code base and don't add them into sample configuration, for example, or something like this. So let's talk about configuration a little bit. 
the goal is to kind of fix it. Uh, by fix, I mean uh, to follow this principle. So adding sensible defaults, minimizing the number of external dependencies like API services and other stuff, and keeping configuration organized. Having sensible defaults means having such defaults where you don't have to change. You don't have to change it. So you don't have to see this change me or ask me values in your exact example configuration files. You even don't have this example configuration files actually. Because every required change that a developer have to make during the project setup could lead to a error, to failure. And that could lead to message in Slack, you, hey, man, help me, I don't know what to do. I don't want to be distracted as a team leader, as well. So that's why I'm caring about making this process smooth. And uh, again, coming back to Docker, some things come free with it because you have this uh, configuration file and you have to configure services and to, to keep them know where to find each other. But uh, other things like uh, external dependencies, like for example, AWS for storage service, uh, you cannot just configure it in the repository. Well, maybe you can, but I don't think it's a good idea. Uh, instead, I suggest using local services you don't have uh, credentials for AWS. It doesn't make sense, at least for the first time you're working with a project to have everything uh, that you have in production configured locally. Maybe later you ask me and I'll tell you the credentials, but for the first time you don't need it, especially if you don't work on that part of the application. You may be front-end developer or I don't know, whoever it, whatever it is. Oh, the same thing is uh, with external APIs. Uh, if th this API is not as your, in your hot path, it's kind of optional stuff in your application. Just make it now operable in development by default. Don't force developers to search for credentials somewhere in the wiki, GitHub, uh, whatever, Slack, you know, and other places. Uh, let's talk about how to keep uh, configuration organized a little bit. And start with a problem I call the amp hell. So it's a typical situation when in Rails application, uh, there is a lot of usages of n variables across the, the whole code base and also environment checks like env production, env development, and whatever. That's not so good in terms of maintainability and even understandability, I know they use their word, uh, of what is going on in your applications. And uh, env checks, for example, are uh, especially painful when you want to add a custom environment, and then you have to add that everywhere. So that's why we limit the, the env usage only to configuration files like development RB, application RB, and so on. And we remove all the AMP checks. We interplace them with custom configuration settings like this. That makes it more readable uh, and it makes it more easy to kind of configure. You can even change this setting in production if you want to enable it for a while. And uh, not rely on the environment name itself, which doesn't make sense at all. And uh, to make it work, to easier to do with this refactoring, uh, we build a custom Rubicop cop which detects this. Uh, unsafe environment variables usage, and also later prevent others from doing this when we add this to our CI. Another problem is kind of .env specific, but I guess most of you use .env or something like this, right? Raise your hand. Yeah, well, at least half of you. And this is a problem. Uh, the .env file could be really, really big. Uh, and it turned out that uh, it looks like I'm working with the worst applications in the world because I'm here and somewhere in 50 to 100. And in production, it becomes even more. You know, having more than 100 configuration variables for your production application means you don't know what is going on here. And then you need to change something, you have to spend a lot of time looking for it. That's why I was thinking about a better way to keep configuration in Rails application. And the idea I came up is the following. So we have different types of credentials or parameters. So actually we have sensitive information, let's call it secrets, and non-sensitive, let's call it just configuration settings. And we keep them in different places. We can use uh, credentials and store our secrets right in the repo uh, just for sensitive data like API keys, secret key base or whatever. We can keep anything else which doesn't have any 
value, like uh, you know, bucket name, for example, doesn't make sense, or you know, host name for your CDN. We can keep it in named YML config. And one thing that we want to have is ability to override any configuration through env if we really need to, to avoid this uh, step of committing and pushing, just changing the environment in production. Uh, one fact about credentials, so on Rails 6, they uh, got better. Now you have uh, ability to store per environment credentials, different key sets for different environments. And that's actually what mo make me, made me move to this kind of configuration setup. Uh, and for that I'm using a gem called uh, Anyway Config. This is a pretty old gem of mine, one of the first one. And it's become useful for Rails applications just for when credentials appeared because it handles all the complexity of fetching data from different sources and hide us from you because you don't have to care about it. You can override anything through env if you want, you can override through credentials, or you can just stay, store, store everything in plain YML files. So it's like, uh, it could be work, uh, used like Rails config for methods, or it could be used with named and class-based configuration which provide additional value. So check this out if you experience the env help. Uh, let's start with this setup phase, finally start playing the game, right? So we on Mars and we ready for terraforming. And terraforming starts with atmosphere in our game. And I compare an atmosphere with tests, with your test suite that you have in your application, why so? So because, for multiple reasons actually, because developing without tests is like, you know, breathing without air, uh, you will die eventually. Uh, <laughs> Breathing uh, rarefied thin air is kind of requires more effort and running slow tests require more time. You're wasting time, actually. And flaky tests, polluted tests, like in Chelyabinsk, you know, that's a city in uh, Ural Mountains. That's a good city when you can see a meteor in real life, so very space-themed city. But breathing there is kind of complicated. Uh, it could lead to unexpected consequences. So the goal of this phase uh, is to make tests reliable and fast, to not block the development. And let's start with this test speed improvements. Um, okay, you're probably gonna raise your hand, everyone. Uh, let me show you uh, the tool that could help you, that not could, but actually that will help you to fix this problem a little bit at least. And this is called is test prof. You probably heard about it. I don't know. It appeared in Ruby Weekly a few times. What is it? So TestProf is a meta jam or toolbox. It's actually a collection of different <coughs> profilers and extensions for test frameworks, even Rubacop Cops, to make it easier to refactor tests to make them faster. So that meant to be used with legacy code bases. Actually, it was born in production. So if we call test environment production. So uh, we used it on the project. We needed to speed our test because, not because our local round time actually, because our CI builds time. It was really, really bad. And uh, at the end, uh, we came up with a bunch of scripts. We improved our test suite speed by a factor of four. And finally, we extracted it into a gem called TestProf. So how did we do that? How we improved our test suite uh, speed? Well, this story would require two talks, not just the half that we'll have left here. So I, hopefully, I already told about it a few times the uh, previous year, and that's the last one from the Paris RB last summer, 99 problems of slow tests. It covers 99 problems of slow tests, okay? <laughs> that's the title says. And today, I'm gonna share just a few highlights of it, so just to show you the ideas behind this improvement. And the first one, uh, I like it most because uh, I just saw the talk of uh, fixing the flaky test, really good talk, but uh, it still had this idea of maybe you still need database cleaner. Well, 99% you don't. Uh, especially in new rails, it's kind of a no need by default because the only problem was uh, where we need database cleaner was that uh, System tasks, capybara tests, use multiple threads, and each thread uses its own connection, and we couldn't use transactional tests, transactional fixtures. With Rails 5.1, uh, in test environment, active record 
use the same connection in all threads, and we can use transactions. And rolling back transaction is a fastest and more, well, the best way to clean up your data. So just use transactional tests everywhere, and you don't need it. If you're running all the Rails, even Rails 3.2, uh, you can use test prof patch uh, from this package, so it's doing pretty much the same. That's what we used before Rails 5, actually. Another problem, uh, which is quite popular, inlining background jobs in tests by default, or so-called sidekick chain. I like this term by Nate. So, the idea is to, that you're running all the jobs by default, inlining them in tests, and you waste a lot of time because you have to serialize the jobs argument, actually. You have to execute jobs. And in most cases, you don't need it. Well, in some cases, your tests might rely on inlining. Well, just mark them as dependent on sidekick inline, for example, using shared context for RSpec. And uh, with TestProf, we had the same problem, and uh, I had to write Another automation tool, I'm not gonna to talk about it today, it's described in this post, but it allows you to automatically mark all the tests which requires inline sidekick, and line background job with this shared context and just refactor everything in three steps. Uh, another problem, factories. So most people use factories, and it doesn't matter whether the factory girl actually or fabrication, for example. Uh, you still have this problem of factory cascades, likely. So that's the situation when creating one record actually involves creating five records, or maybe a dozen, or maybe two dozen of records. Uh, that's so-called factory cascade. And it's very expensive to create active record objects due to validations, object creations, callbacks, all that stuff, not even database calls. Again, I'm navigating you to Martians Chronicles, Test Prof Part 2, blog post, which describes how to detect this stuff and how to fix it. And much more things uh, you can read in the official documentation website where you can find links to the post and to video talks. Uh, a little bit about flakiness. So I already told that there was a talk about this, and I, again, recommend to take a look because it focuses on the main problems with flaky tests in Rails applications. Um, I prepared, but I'm not gonna share the whole guide here. It's called Fight the Flakiness Checklist. It's available on the website with some bullet points of what you should take care of. What I want to tell here, something new, um, which is uh, the tool I, oh, this slide shouldn't be there, sorry. Okay, and this one, oh. Okay, uh, sorry, that, that one, I was looking for it. So the tool I wrote recently called, it's a working title, it's not that good, Factory Linter. What it does, so it solves one, for now it solves one particular problem when you have uh, unique constraints in your database, but you don't have a proper randomness in your factories. So even using Faker, for example, Faker is not for randomness, it's just for human readable values. Uh, some, Thing. Some people suggest not using it at all at tests, but I like it because I want to see human readable uh, stuff in my failure screenshots for system tests. Um, but the thing is, um, for unique constrained attributes, you should use sequence uh, to guarantee that your test won't fail someday, just once, maybe a year, but that could be annoying. That's what this tool does, it analyze factories and compare it to database and Show, show you where you have this problem. Okay, uh, where is the point where our tests not only green, but they're not blocking our development a lot. They kind of fast, fast enough, and they do not have a, a lot of flakiness. And at this point, we're actually ready to bring more people to the project, but terraforming process hasn't been complete. So if you know that terraforming Mars starts with red Mars, then it's uh, blue Mars where we now, and then it's green Mars. And for green Mars, we first of all need to see this cat. Uh, that's a slide to drink water. Okay, now, actually we need to turn ice into water. There's a lot of ice on Mars, you know. And that means to bring the project to a healthy state. Uh, and it covers a lot of stuff from security, 
which has been covered in the previous talk this room, and performance and consistency. So I'm going to repeat, because most of you will hear, a uh, few security points. Uh, just a quick note. When I talk about security, I'm not talking about really real security audit, uh, which we do, but much later, mostly before shipping major features. At the first place, we just do a quick security analysis using simple tools like Bunder Audit, uh, which is great too. I actually don't know why we don't have it by default in a Rails jam file. We should probably add it because it helps you to follow the known vulnerabilities uh, discovered in Ruby gems. And you'll be surprised that almost every week there is a new vulnerability in Ruby world. So this one, I think, I'm not sure this is a fresh one. It's going to be two weeks old, maybe. And what's good about this uh, in Ruby community, most of the vulnerability fixes are fixed, sorry, not issues fixed quickly. So you just have to upgrade to patch version and you're safe to go. Another tool is to check your application code as a well-known breakman tool, which scan your code for bad patterns, like uh, using params directly in your views, for example, or in your SQL string queries. And Rubicop is not only formatting tool, it's actually not formatting tool. It could only also be used to uh, check your application for insecure or dangerous Ruby code, like JSON load, for example, or YML load, and so, and so on and so forth. You can just run security department for Rubicop and check the code base. Let's talk about consistency. And when we're talking about consistency, we usually mean database. And in that case, I want to talk about the consistency between database and your business logic, your models, your actually validations and associations. Um, having database in inconsistent state compared to models is easier. The most popular problem is that you have a string type, which is doesn't exist in Postgres in your migration, and you don't have a length validation in your model, that could lead to exceptions that you don't want to see, that you probably won't catch and show 500 error to your users. That's not good. And hopefully there is a tool, because, well, if you know how to do that manually, you should probably build a tool for that. And there it is. It's called database consistency. So it has about five checks, different checks. and um, it analyzes your models, active record models, and your database schema, and shows some kind of inconsistency. For example, you have a presence validation, but you don't have a null false constraint in your database, which means that in your database, it's valid to have null value for this row, for this column in the row. But from the terms of your application, it is invalid. That could lead, again, to uh, undefined method for nil exceptions, for example. And another gem, which is kind of companion for this database consistency, uh, called database validations. It works a little bit differently. It replaces Rails building uh, methods, like belongs to a uh, uniqueness validation, with database-backed versions. And it checks that uh, the corresponding foreign keys are present, and that unique index is present if you're checking for uniqueness. So it's kind of make sure that you're not just describing your logic in your application, but also in the database. Um, when we're talking about consistency, uh, we can't just skip this question, does code style matter, you know? Um, I'm a big fan of consistent code style of Rubicop and all that stuff. I've been using it since early days. But I'm not sure that's a good idea to just add a Rubicop config to a new project, to an old new project, and uh, you know, run autocorrect and just push this uh, at the pull request and make reviewers cry. Uh, that's not the way to use Rubicop with legacy projects if they don't have it or don't follow the rules. Instead, we're using it a little bit differently. So we have a so-called strict configuration, strict mode for Rubicop. It just uh, enforces a small subset of copes, uh, disabling everything by default, and enabling only, only those we want to enforce, like security department, some linters, and testing copes as well, like to avoid focus tests and builds to not make 
as things that test pass, but they're actually not running everything. That's a big problem. And we always enforce this strict uh, Rubocop check uh, in our CI and prevent deployments if it doesn't pass. Another thing regarding Rubocop, we use some kind of progressive code base enhancement, which means that we add Rubocop check, use Rubocop checks only for Terraform code. So the newly written code by ours or refactor code that we already fixed. That means that we explicitly define the files to include and to check, um, which is, could be tricky, it depends on your usage. In our case, we just have a kind of a isolated namespace. Every functionality has been put into a particular module and that configuration looks pretty simple. Another thing, uh, usually people argue a lot about which cops to choose or which style to choose. Don't do that, use standard. So standard is kind of a new thing. It's still not 1.0, but I think it's gonna be 1.0 and it's gonna be more popular. Just start an early adopter, use it everywhere. It has a pretty good base configuration for Rubocop. You can use it as standalone, or as I show here, you can integrate it with your existing Rubocop configuration. And um, just start using standard. Don't argue about code style. Let's make it consistent between different projects. Another thing that we want to eliminate during this phase is side effects. Uh, what kind of side effects? Well, I'm gonna talk about only the one of it, non-atomic transactions. Uh, what do I mean here? So, in database, transactions have a property of atomicity. But you can break it on, at the application level by doing some uh, non, not safe operations from within transactions like performing HTTP calls or enqueuing background jobs, sending emails. That's, again, a typical example. So we, we don't know that there is an after commit callback or after create commit in that case. And we will send an email to a user even if our transaction will not be committed. So that's not a good idea. In, in the best case, we just will have an exception somewhere in the, some system. In the worst case, we will have something really strange, it's gonna be hard to debug and find the cause of it. So to deal with this, again, one more tool to add to your bookmarks. So I wrote a gem which called Isolator. It uh, integrates uh, into actually different uh, ORM frameworks, not only Active Record, and it tries to detect uh, dangerous operations from within transactions like HTTPs and, and so on and so forth. So, and it could raise an exception, so for example, we use it in tests. It works with tests, it understands transactional features, so it could be used there. Or you can conf configure it to send notifications to your error notifying system, for example. So, that's another way to make sure the project is kind of safe and stable, it doesn't have unpredictable stuff in it. One last thing I want to talk about is dead code. Uh, why? So it also adds some overhead of working with a new project because, well, for example, you have a dead template and you're working on some templating related feature. You don't know whether you have to fix it everywhere in every template or maybe most of them are dead and not in use anymore. That's the most typical situation. View templates are usually left uh, when code is removed. And not only view templates, we already have problems with uh, unused gems, for example. And uh, when the gem file consists, uh, you know, several dozens of gems, it's kind of easy to just take a look and figure out w which one could be removed. When there are more than 100, you probably need some help. Um, tracking which gems are used and which are not is turned out to be kind of complex stuff. I tried different approaches and uh, the best one and the fastest one, well, the best one probably would be using TracePoint, but that's gonna be, uh, you're gonna run your tests, for example, uh, for multiple days. Uh, and uh, this approach use object allocation tracing, and the idea is to show the gems which haven't left any trace in the object space. So that's how I try to detect unused gems. Yeah, that's required a pretty decent uh, test coverage, of course. So the worse test coverage, the less accurate, 
the results. And there are some interesting stuff, like for example, Rails that gem doesn't have any trace in object space because it's just a collection of gems that it requires. It doesn't have anything inside itself. But yeah, you can just, well, for my case, out of 130 uh, gems, I had a list of 20. So these 20 gems I can check manually later. For roles and controllers, uh, so for example, for dead roles or dead controller actions, there is a pretty good and pretty old, eight years old actually, jam called Trace Rule by Akira Matsuda. It works perfectly, just run it from time to time and see what's going on in your code base. As I mentioned, uh, from my experience, the biggest problem is with view templates. And as it turned out, there is no uh, at least well-maintained jam for that. There was one, it's called Flatfoot or something like that, but it doesn't look up to date. It will probably not work with the recent Rails versions. That's how why I had to write a little simple implementation again to use with tests. As you noticed, I'm mostly using tests, not actually to run tests, but to analyze the code base. That's an approach I'm using a lot in development. And it could track uh, unused uh, partials and templates as well. And uh, something new, while I was here in Minneapolis, a friend of mine sent me a link to his new work, we, uh, the gem called Factory Trace. Uh, so this gem, tracks unused factories and factory traits for factory bot. Which is also cool because, well, you don't need code you don't use anymore. So, that's the end of phase three. So our planet, our Mars, looks much more like Earth, right? About a thousand years ago. Because we still need to uh, rebuild their civilization, but that's the whole different story. Uh, what I can, would like to tell you, well, three minutes, yeah, that's enough. Uh, a little bit more stuff. So we're ready to bring humans on Mars. And, well, we can bring not only humans, uh, but robots. Because robots could do all the dirty stuff we don't want to do. And I want to share some two tools we actually use, again, almost everywhere. Uh, it's we, I found very useful. Uh, the first one is called left hook. And as you might see, uh, it's a git hook manager, yeah. Yet again, a git hook manager. What makes it different from others? Um, first of all, it's kind of a platform, language, whatever, agnostic. Well, most popular git hooks are written for particular languages like Node.js or Ruby. This one, Written is not in a language which compiles into a binary. I don't want to call the name of this language. You probably figure out it. And um, it could be used, well, pretty much everywhere. And it used some interesting features. So, yeah, this is Evil Martians project. But it is kind of a um, project built by the whole team because we were thinking about features and we wanted to build something to be useful for everyone. So it has some things like tags to make it possible to disable some features, some checks for, for example, front-end developers run only front-end hooks, back-end only back-end hooks. They still use the same configuration, but they can disable some things locally. It integrates with Docker again, and, uh, well, it's cool. We're gonna announce it a little bit later, but you can start using it. Yeah, just one more slide demonstration. And another tool. Oh, I really like. It's called Danger. It's not the new one, uh, but it's turned out again very useful. It helps you to automate code reviews. And actually, despite from the name, it makes code reviewing less danger. You don't have to waste time for routine tasks. For, for example, you don't need to check whether the schema RB file has been updated when migrations have been added. That could be done automatically by this robot and uh, you can focus only on things that matters. It can tell you that, oh, gem file log has been changed, check what, what has been changed in there, or some other stuff. So you see that a lot of messages we can get from it. So that's pretty much it, and uh, the final round ended, and we ready to calculate the final scores. So as a result of this uh, work on legacy application, so not only this talk came up, but also this repository, which contains 
all, everything I mentioned here and some more stuff, and it's gonna be more and more stuff in there. It, I just started working on it. So everything I told you about today is available on GitHub. So you feel free to start terraforming your legacy applications today uh, or not. You, you can do, not do it yourself, maybe. Maybe someone can help you. Um, <laughs> sorry, I have to do that. <laughs> um, yeah, some announcements. I'm trying to write a lot of stuff uh, on DevTools these days, but well, with this conference and uh, whatever. I'm just keeping three drafts which related to this topic, which is gonna be released in the next few months. Special thanks to this website for illustrations, and thank you, I have stickers. Have a conferencing. Mm -hmm.